Indeed, when we were with you, I was warning you that we all Christians were destined to be subjected to tribulation. 1 Thessalonians 3, 4 As representatives of the Lord who bought us, keep in mind all the terrible opposition He, our Lord Jesus Christ, endured against Himself at the hands of sinful men, so as not to grow sick at heart and give up. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3 Here is a trustworthy saying, If we died with Him, we will also live with Him. If we persevere in suffering and trials, we will also reign with Him. If we disown Him, He will also disown us. If we are faithless, He will remain faithful, for He cannot disown Himself. 2 Timothy 2.11-13 Following the example of the Lord who died on our behalf in all things, and most especially in the matter of endurance of unjust treatment, is fundamental to the Christian life. A popular saying in recent times, what would Jesus do is off the mark. We are not Jesus, and we are not facing what he faced, not in the least, especially in regard to dying for the sins of the world. Rather, we should always be asking ourselves, what does Jesus want me to do and then do it? As the one who redeemed us, the one who has purchased our freedom from sin and death at the cost of his blood, his spiritual death on the cross for all of our sins, our Lord certainly has the right to ask this of us, namely, the endurance of mistreatment in a way that glorifies him. We owe him absolutely everything, and nothing in this life is as valuable as his good pleasure towards us. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Matthew chapter 25 verse 21 Successful navigation of the undeserved suffering test is not the stuff of spiritual immaturity. It takes knowing our Lord intimately to be able to persevere under particularly difficult circumstances. It takes a maximum amount of truth in the heart, believed and held fast, ready and waiting for the Spirit to make use of when the storms of life arise. The Bible is the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16, and so in order to know what our Lord wants of us, requires that we first give attention to everything He has given us in His word of truth. Only then do we have a chance of effectively carrying out the commands, both explicit and implicit, contained in this passage of Scripture. Therefore, spiritual maturity is an essential prerequisite to fulfilling the mandates given here. Our Lord perfectly exemplifies this principle, having successfully learned and applied the entirety of the truth of Scripture throughout His earthly life. Compare, for example, His use of Scripture to refute the devil. Luke chapter 4 verse 1 through 13. While we will never reach that pinnacle of success in our Christian walk, that is at least the objective we have been given, for His is the example we are explicitly told to follow here. Therefore, since Christ died in His flesh, we also should arm ourselves with the same mindset, considering that whoever has suffered in His flesh as Jesus did is finished with sin. 1 Peter 4, 1 As our Lord committed no sin, in an analogous way, we must turn away from all that is sinful, doing so more and more as we grow, taking pains to immediately repent of our mistakes, willful or otherwise, and as soon as possible confess all our sins and get back on the right road. That is especially so regarding sins of the heart and tongue in the context here of enduring maltreatment, where the temptation to retaliate verbally is obviously very strong. The particular example that Peter uses in presenting the example of Christ is our Lord's refraining from retaliating to the slander thrown at him and also from offering up threats to those who were abusing him. In the context of slavery and in the context of working for an employer, this is a very pertinent issue for the apostle to bring up. We know from, for example, James, James chapter 3, verse 2 through 12, and personal experience that verbal sinning is among the hardest sort of error to avoid. I said, I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth while in the presence of the wicked. So I remained utterly silent, not even saying anything good. But my anguish increased. My heart grew hot within me. While I meditated, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Psalm chapter 39, verse 1 through 3. The temptation to even the score with those whom we feel have wronged us is subtle and often intense. 
so that even if we are able to resist calling out superiors to their faces, it is often quite tempting to share our grievances with our co-workers, presenting our bosses in a very much less than flattering light. This sort of slander is the quintessential way in which underlings get back or protect themselves from overweening conduct from above. It is also very deceptive in that it may not seem sinful, depending upon what we say exactly. But even if what we say is not an outright lie, depending upon our motives and our particular words, we always run the risk of committing slander when we say anything negative about anyone else, and most especially about those in direct authority over us. Absolute silence is a difficult personal standard to adhere to, as the passage from the psalm quoted demonstrates, but believers do need to keep in mind the principle of avoiding slander and the example of our Lord in refraining from it, though if anyone had cause, surely he did, in any and all workplace situations where we are being badly treated by our lights. And there is another problem with this self-vindicating approach as well. Christians are supposed to trust the Lord, to wait on Him for solutions, to put our deliverance in His hands, and not to take it into our own hands. But if we engage in slander, and if we are tempted to take things a step further, and engage in any sort of guile or machinations or office politics designed to undermine the ones we feel are oppressing us, we have removed the matter from out of the Lord's hands and taken it back into our own. The end result of such behavior will never be as blessed as if we had patiently waited on Him instead. Christians need to keep in mind that things always go better when we trust the Lord and always go worse when we trust in our own efforts instead. So while it is not realistic to think that we can get to the point where we never feel slighted and never ever complain about our treatment, the more we overlook slights and the less we complain, the better for us in every way from a spiritual point of view. This better approach, after all, is the one our Lord always took, and He is the example we are to follow. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 2 The temptation to threaten his persecutors experienced by our Lord must have been tremendous. He created them, and he was about to die for their sins, and he will be the one who judges them, but he did not succumb. No temptation to utter threats we shall ever experience could possibly be as great as what he endured. And we know that the judge himself is with us in whatever maltreatment we may be called upon to suffer through. Whatever retaliation in personal vindication we might possibly be able to inflict or threaten to inflict, nothing can hold a candle to the just judgment and vindication on our behalf which the Lord can and will level on those who lay a finger on His holy ones. At such times, rather than seeking to retaliate, we need to make a point of entrusting our lives to our faithful Creator in doing what is right. 1 Peter 4.19 May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May He consider my cause and uphold it. May He vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. 1 Samuel 24.15 Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O oh, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. Psalm chapter 43, verse 1 After all, it is better to trust in the Lord even than trusting in princes. Psalm chapter 118 verse 9, and certainly better than trusting in ourselves who are powerless. For while we can often do next to nothing, especially when we are talking about abuse from superiors, there is nothing that the Lord cannot do. I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 27. This is not to say that we believers are obliged to be doormats. When threatened by Saul, David escaped to the desert, but was always careful never to lay a hand on the Lord's anointed, trusting the Lord instead to vindicate him in due time. Similarly, we may have to change jobs or make use of legitimate means, internal or external, should the abuse we are suffering cross the line of what is legal and or reasonably acceptable in terms of the organization's policies. But in all cases, it is prudent for believers to leave matters in the Lord's hands as much as possible, even when we are forced into action of one sort or another. And in all cases, it is prudent to refrain from retaliating with the tongue, 
not because we fear those who are wronging us, but because we fear him in whom we have placed our trust to deliver us.